experimenting with is a proto cell, um, which has been described as living technology, and I'll talk about that in, in, in my talk. And then, um, in, by mapping out the evolution of evolutionary design tools, then to look at what the implications of the emergence of these new and intrinsically complex technologies um, could be. Um, so I'm just going to test the technology that I've got in front of me, which is Okay, so I just want to make sure that we're starting on the right, right page. I mean, we all think we know what evolution is, um, but I think lots of people have very slightly different views on what evolution is. So where I'm coming from is that evolution is a naturalistic theory of the history of life on Earth. That's essentially what we do, or how we, how we think about evolution. It's a process and it's a phenomenology, and, and we can measure that through the organisational change of um, creatures with time. We do that through the fossil record, you know, we can look at um, differences between um, uh, morphology and species, um, we can look at biochemistry, we can look at all kinds of different ways in which one organism might differ from, differ from another, and that gives us some idea of um, how uh, evolution has manifested itself. And also, it affects humans. So we're actually part of an evolutionary story, the story of life on Earth. And, and where I think the, where I'm going to start the story of the evolution of evolutionary design tools is with um, Charles Darwin's Origins of Species, 1859, where he describes a material physical relationship between um, uh, organisms and the environment they find themselves in as being responsible um, for this change in process over time. Darwin didn't invent the evolution, evolution um, and the, the idea of change with time um, had existed long before Darwin, but what Darwin managed to do was to express a philosophy and a relationship which has enabled modern science to um, develop technologies that um, allow us um, to uh, influence and modify evolutionary processes more so than we've been doing before. Because of course, you know, we've, we've always had um, you know, the ability to choose partners, selective breeding of animals. Um, so the modification of evolution or this, this um, engagement with fate um, and our desire to influence our future has been with us as part of our culture ever since we can remember. So it's not something new to want to be able to um, influence um, evolutionary processes. Um, and, and of course, in, in the, the, the next part of the story happens around about 1953, when um, Watson, uh, Crick and uh, Wilkins um, discover the structure of, of DNA. And it gives a plausible, um, uh, material um, basis through which we can actually start to investigate um, how uh, evolution relates to structural changes within organisms and gives rise to a science called biotechnology, which effectively sees the collapse of evolutionary time. Biotechnology is um, about the uh, transference of um, the uh, Darwinian processes or the um, genetic processes underpinning um, evolutionary theory and being transferred into bacteria which have got much um, faster life cycles than us and by literally transposing genetics into bacterial vectors we managed to get a collapse in evolutionary time. What biotechnology didn't do though was to take the random element out of the, the, the theory of evolution and that's what the, in the last 15 years synthetic biology has, has started to um, orchestrate. So synthetic biology differs from its predecessor biotechnology in what's called rational design engineering. So if one did think of the cell as being a machine, what the um, synthetic biologists are able to do is to take specific parts of cell machinery, modify them to create different outcomes without going through this process of um, random selection, which uh, is one of the, 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 the modern um, uh, theories that um, it drives evolution. 
Um, so synthetic biology takes out the, the, the randomness and introduces this notion of rational design engineering. Where I'm working is a slightly different kind of um, synthetic biology. I'm not interested in bio bricks or um, prefab tools, as it were, that have been produced by um, biology, DNA, cell organelles, all those kinds of things. I'm interested in um, orchestrating the molecules of life, going down as, as, as low as we possibly can, and looking at um, the self-assembly of um, uh, chemical systems and, and how we can orchestrate those to create an alternative kind of biological process that isn't limited um, by the functionality of DNA. Yes, DNA has a, has, has a fantastic ability to orchestrate and it's established, but what about if we open up the um, uh, solution space available to us? There are many different um, self-assembly chemical systems on Earth, and it would be nice to see what the design potential is if we give ourselves access to all these um, potential um, uh, design tools. And, and there's, a, there's a whole range of terminology that comes out of um, looking at the um, self-assembly of, um, of these, these very molecular-based systems. And so um, living technology is one of these terms. Um, living technology applies um, to um, technologies and, and to, to, it's something that's not established. Bedell et al. have written about it um, in Technoetic Arts, which was published in the last year. Um, so it's, it's not a mature description, but essentially t living technologies have been described as technologies that exhibit some of the properties of living systems, but are not considered to be alive. And my issue with living technology is that it ranges from everything from the internet down to the kinds of uh, chemical cells that, that, that I'm working with. So it's not a very specific thing, but I find it a useful phrase to um, try and describe how qualitatively um, you're getting different outcomes from these kinds of technologies that are inherently complex and not Cartesian in terms of their, in terms of their order. So I'm going to show you a film now. I'm probably going to dance around it because I get incredibly excited by it. Um, so this is what I actually see down the microscope. You can turn the lights off if you like so you don't see the dance. Right, okay, this is a protocell, this, this, um, uh, this little droplet, it's based on oil and water. This is a reverse phase solution, um, it's um, an oil based uh, medium with um, sodium hydroxide um, in, the, um, uh, in, in the oil space. And what's happening is that the protocell is acting like a chemical computer. It's able to sense its environment, it's able to modify it, it's able to undergo complex um, reactions such as shedding skins and it can actually build um, quite complex structures and some of them actually have quite um, a, a lot of biological um, homologies. And there's similarities uh, between biological processes. They can fuse, they can divide, they can create spiral shapes. Um, so they're, they're, they're very spatial um, and they're um, able to uh, literally um, create um, uh, physical calculations you know, that are contingent on the environmental conditions in which they find themselves. All these protests are in the same medium under the same condition, but the variety of morphologies that occur, even within a single um, protest cell itself, um, are, are, are amazing. And it, and it reminds me of um, uh, uh, Donald Williamson's theory about how he describes the um, Cambrian explosion. He has it through the fossil record, and um, it's in um, uh, one of um, Rockman's collections for the, for the Edge. <coughs> what he says is that um, the Cambrian explosion is um, caused by the act active mixing and matching of um, uh, larval and adult body types. Um, and you kind of think, well, that's, that's, that's silly because there must be genetics. But maybe at the, in the pre-Cambrian stage, the genetics is not deterministic in the same way as it is today. And if you look at these agents, in some ways, we're, we're modeling this. Because this creature started off as a cell-like thing, now it's kind of a little bit of a worm, and at some stage, it goes through a jellyfish um, stage of transition. Not only that, it is very social. You'll now start to... <laughs> Have you not heard anything I've said? <laughs> so, so they're incredibly social, they love each other. Look at this. They, they all kind of snuggle up to each other. And there's actually... I don't know how to describe it very scientifically, but there's some kind of dialogue 
going on that's, that's at a chemical level between the oil-water interface and, 